Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this deep dive into the nesting behaviors in Western pond turtles, led by the lovely Wendy St. John. My name is Nicolette Michael, and I'm an outreach assistant with the Center for Environmental Inquiry. Our public events are usually done by either our Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain in Pengrove or our Gullbreath Preserve near Yorkville in Mendocino. And though we're feeling the challenges of shelter in place, like you all, we're happy to be able to reach people during this time and connect in new ways. Uh, before I let Wendy take it away, I want to tell you a little bit about what the Center for Environmental Inquiry is and how it can be a resource to you, no matter if you are affiliated with Sonoma State or not, whether you're a student, parent, government employee, educator, member of the public, or, organi or organization in need of environmental solutions. The Center envisions the North Bay working together to find sustainable solutions across all uh, sectors of society by providing a uh, first-hand understanding of our connection with the environment and the ability to, to, to build skills that will help um, give us sustainable solutions. We're talking about helping people become aware and motivated, prepared, and engaged um, in our society. Many ways to get involved are to engage in research, uh, uh, join the naturalist and land management training programs, do internships and student jobs, attend events like these, access data, um, and lead or contribute to an event, or partner with us on projects. Okay. Okay, you are important in addressing the greatest environmental challenges in history, and engaged society is critical, and diversity is critical. Today, we're going to focus on Western pond turtles. We're going to look at what factors determine whether turtles choose to lay their nest, or where turtles choose to lay their nest, whether they return to the same nesting locations multiple times, and we'll, we'll learn about the Sonoma State research connected on these topics and explore the questions that we have about Western pond turtles. The event is in the format of our deep dive format that consists of a live presentation with a Q&A segment at the end. So today we'll spend about 45 minutes hearing from Wendy St. John, and then 10 to 15 minutes for the Q&A section at the end. So you all are currently muted. Um, so please use the chat box. Um, so please use the chat box if you have any questions um, or comments such as you can't hear the presenter. Wendy will not be reading the chat until the end of the presentation, but I'll be monitoring it. So if you have a question in the middle as well, you can ask it and maybe we can um, we can have some impromptu questions during the middle and then for most of the questions might be at the end. Okay. Um, you're welcome to have your video on or off um, and um, during the entire presentation, whatever you feel like. And okay, now that I think that most everyone is here, I'm going to ask you all to please type in the chat the name, your name in the chat box. This will be our sign-in sheet for the day, since sometimes Zoom usernames aren't the same as the names you register under. So I'd really appreciate it if you could all type in the chat uh, your full name. The chat is on the bottom um, bar of the screen, and it will light up orange when someone chats in there. So you can write it down. Oh, I see all the names. Thank you, everyone. That's great. Okay. So um, now I'm very happy to introduce Wendy St. John, uh, a lecturer with, with the Department of Biology and Geography, P Environmental, and Planning at Sonoma State University. So thank you, Wendy. Go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Nicolette. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, yes, I can hear yep. you. Okay, cool. <laughs> so um, I'm just really uh, pleased to be introduced by Nicolette, who um, has, was a student of mine in her first year here at Sonoma State, and now she's getting ready to graduate. It's just been really fun to watch that progression um, for her. Um, and uh, I'm also uh, very grateful to have been invited to give this talk today. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the research that I did when I was um, earning my master's thesis. Um, we, I did a bunch of uh, uh, field seasons looking at western pond turtles. This is a western pond turtle right here. A female, you can see very photogenic. You can see why I wanted to spend all of my summers with them. 
Um, so I'm just going to jump in and uh, yeah, we'll talk about the research that I did um, for my master's thesis. So the, one of the main themes of my thesis was an, uh, um, a subject called nest site selection. Um, and so this can be crucial to the reproductive success of egg laying animals. That does, that's probably not a big you know, leap for any of us. If you think about it, if you lay eggs, the place that you choose to lay them is going to be important, right? Um, and in some cases, and these, my turtles are an example of this, that the site selection isn't just about keeping the eggs safe, but can actually increase the, uh, influence the fitness and even the phenotype of the offspring. So phenotype, that's a word that may not be familiar to, um, to, all of, to anyone who doesn't have a biology ba uh, background, but the phenotype is just the, the, the expressed trait. So um, with turtles, the phenotypic trait that is of interest to us here is actually going to be their sex. Um, we're used to thinking of, you know, humans and a lot of other organisms that sex is determined based on chromosomes, right? Um, and the, you know, which, which version of the chromosomes you get from your parents. In these turtles, it's actually determined by the temperature at which the eggs incubate. So that's a little bit different. And that's a great example of how nest site selection can be really important for these turtles and for other organisms as well. So what are some of the features of a suitable nest site? First of all, obviously, it has to be accessible to the female. She needs to be able to get there in order to lay her eggs. It has to um, provide appropriate conditions for the offspring. It needs to be th like the right temperature, the right amount of humidity. Um, it has to be in a location that's going to provide protection from the elements, from predators, all of those sorts of things. And then finally, after the eggs hatch, it has to provide appropriate dispersal opportunities for hatchlings. They need to be able to get from the nest to wherever they need to go next to, to, to start their life out in the world as juveniles. So one strategy that many egg laying animals um, exhibit is something that we call nest site fidelity. And this is when animals return to the same location or very nearby locations for multiple nesting events. Uh, lots of egg laying animals do this. Um, and we think that, that one of the, the reasons that this behavior evolved was because it can confer benefits in times of environmental stability, right? If you, if you were able to successfully nest in one location one time, it would make sense to just assume that continuing to nest in that location, you would continue to have success. Um, some of the organisms that we know do it. Um, it's very well documented in birds. These are northern gannets. Um, these are ones that actually were nesting on the Bass Rock um, off the coast of Scotland um, near Edinburgh. I took these photos a few years ago um, and they returned to the same rock year and year and year and year after year. Um, alligators, this is an American alligator. They're also um, animals that have uh, exhibited nest site fidelity as well. Um, and then this is something that's been really well documented in some turtle species. So in particular, marine turtles, so this would be an example right here. Um, you know, we're probably all familiar with images of them, the females coming up onto the beach to lay their eggs. Turtles, even though um, many turtles are very aquatic, like marine turtles spend almost their entire lives in the water, but they have to come on land to nest. And that's true for all species of turtles. Um, and so, uh, but these marine turtles, what happens is a, a little baby turtle is born on this beach. That little turtle will make it out to the ocean and then spend the next several years, you know, while they become adults, swimming perhaps thousands and thousands of miles away from where they were born. And then when the female turtle is ready to lay her own eggs, she will return to often to this very same beach to lay her eggs. So it's a pretty remarkable um, behavior. And we don't entirely understand exactly how they know where to go and, and, and those things, but it's, it's a really interesting behavior. Um, and we know that a lot of marine turtles do it. Now we also know that some freshwater species do it. So this here, this is a painted turtle. That's one of the animals that um, had been a freshwater aquatic turtle that had been studied. But what we didn't know was whether or not western pond turtles exhibited this. Um, so western pond turtles are the species of, of turtle that's native to 
our part of the world. It's the only freshwater aquatic turtle that is native to um, California and then up into sort of Oregon, Washington, what we would call the Pacific Slope. Um, there is the other native um, turtle species that we have is the desert tortoise um, in the more southern uh, arid parts of, but we wouldn't really consider that a freshwater turtle um, because it lives on it lives on land most um, pretty much throughout its whole life. So um, we wanted to look specifically at the western pond turtle. And so in terms of the, the objectives of my research, the, the two things that I'm going to really talk about today um, was, first of all, one of the main, the main things I wanted to do was to describe the preferred nesting habitat and the characteristic nesting behaviors of this species. Because there had been some research done on them, but not huge amounts of research. And the more that we can understand the natural history of any species, the better chance that we have to help them if they become in need of conservation, right? It's going to allow us to know what sort of things the species needs in order to continue to thrive into the future. And then my other, the other research question that I'm going to talk about today was to investigate whether or not there are any non-random nesting behaviors happening with these turtles. Now, in specifically, what we'll look at today is whether or not they exhibit nest site fidelity. We would think of that as a non-random behavior, right? Are they, do the females just come out of the water and just wander around until they feel like plopping down and laying a nest? Or is there some other non-random process involved where they're selecting sites, you know, like where they're, they're selecting sites instead of just a random nesting event? I was frozen there for a second. Okay, so this is where I did my research. You may see that looks familiar. That's where I am right now in my virtual world. Um, is was up at the Boggs Lake Ecological Reserve. This is a property that's owned by the Nature Conservancy um, and managed by a, a local um, a local group in uh, Lake County. Um, so this is up on Cobb Mountain. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Lake County. And it's what it is, is it's um, historically, it's a vernal lake. So a vernal, we usually think of them like we hear about vernal pools. Um, what's special about vernal pools is that we would consider those ephemeral bodies of water. Um, they aren't spring fed. Um, what they are is it's, a, it's somewhere where there's a, a, just a hard layer underneath that rainwater can catch into them, and then that rainwater will evaporate over the course of the warmer months. So there's not always water in the vernal pool or the vernal lake year round. So that's historically what this habitat was like. Boggs Lake now does tend to hold water year round through many years because of some alterations that were done by previous owners of the land. But um, we still think of it as a vernal as a vernal pool habitat, and it's kind of cool because that means we have some uh, really um, interesting endemic species, things that you can't really find in a lot of other habitats. Um, there's a fairy shrimp. There's some really cool wildflowers. Um, the other thing then that has there's a, a good population um, of western pond turtles at this site, and that's why we decided to do our research at this place because there were lots of turtles here, and this was a great opportunity for us to study them. So what I did, um, and my my research was just one part of a whole bunch of uh, you know larger research program, um, but what I did is I was tracking these turtles to the nest. So I would be out there, I would be out at the field, usually most throughout most of the month of June or, or pretty much the whole month of June in most years. That's the season when the, when the females are going to come out of the water to lay their eggs. Um, so we would wait for them to come out of the water and then we would track them um, with either visual surveys. We would literally just, you know, sort of like do um, we would walk routes along in, throughout, throughout the site and watch for turtles to come out of the water. And then we would sort of try to keep a little bit of a distance and let them go wherever they were going to go to lay their nests. Um, the other thing that we sometimes did is that we would track them using radio telemetry. So we would, um, take, we would pick the turtles up, we would put uh, this temporary transmitter under their back, and then the next day when they would come out again to nest, we would be able to track them at more of a distance using telemetry. So uh, that's what we were doing. We were, we were following these turtles all around, uh, waiting for them to lay their eggs. And then we also took GPS coordinates. So I, I collected a lot of location data for each of the nests that we discovered. So here again, a Western pond turtle. 
Um, let's talk about the size of the population in this uh, at this lake. So over the course of the study, we we captured we captured and marked 95 individual females. So these are females that we we know who they are. They were given a number, and and we have a you know a, a lot of information about um, like when did they nest, what dates did they come out, how many eggs did they lay, all of those sorts of things. So for these individual turtles, we have quite a lot of data. We encountered known individuals, so turtles that we found more than once, um, anywhere between one and 12 times. On average, we would, we would encounter each turtle about four times for a total of 370 different turtle encounters over the course of about uh, eight years. And then there were also 93 additional encounters that took place with unidentified females. So females that for whatever reason, we weren't able to give them, assign them a number and keep track of them throughout the study. And then 82% of all of the turtles that we did find were encountered out of the water more than once. So we had a lot of repeat encounters with these turtles, which is, is part of the reason that I was able to do things like calculate the, the size of the population. So a couple of notable behaviors that we witnessed um, at the site. Most of our females nested every year. Sometimes we would find, you know, there would be a female that didn't nest one year and we'd see her again the next year. Now, just because we didn't find a female nesting in a given year doesn't necessarily mean that she didn't. It might mean that we just didn't happen to see her come out of the water. Um, but for the most part, we would see most of these females year after year after year. And we did have one instance of a female who double clutched. That means that she laid two nests in the single season. She came out really early in the nesting season and laid one nest. And then about three or four weeks later at the end of the season, she came out and laid a second nest. Um, and as far as I know, nobody else had ever documented that behavior in this, this species of turtle. So that was kind of a cool thing. The, another really interesting behavior that we were able to document uh, was my, my lab partner and I, we had gone up to the site, usually we were there throughout June, right, looking at, because that's when the turtles are nesting. But she and I had gone up in April, I honestly don't even remember why we were, what we were doing up at the site that day. Um, but we happened to be there and we went around to some of the previous year's nests and we found that the, the turtles, the juvenile turtles had hatched um, probably back in September, that's when we would have expected them to hatch, but that those babies had stayed in the nests and that now we came at the time when they were starting to, to dig their way out and, and go so that they would crawl out of their nests and then go into the lake. So this was um, evidence that um, at least some members of this species, the babies will hatch and then overwinter in the nest before they then leave the nest and go out into their habitat. Um, so this could be a great strategy for them um, if, the, if potentially the winter months were going to be um, have some challenging environmental conditions. Um, up at Boggs Lake, it's not at all unusual for it to have really cold weather. There can be snow on the ground there for a, a, good, for a good part of the, the winter. Um, and so it seemed like this was a good strategy. They would stay in the nest and then they would not emerge until conditions were going to be better the following spring. Um, so population estimate, that was one of the things that I was able to calculate for this species. Um, I don't want to, I'm not going to go too crazy with talking about stats and, and numbers and things, but we used a program called Program Mark, um, and it's for doing a mark recapture. So the idea is that you have sampled the population and, and kept track of, of which turtles you've already, um, loc like turtles that you've identified. And then at a later time, you sample the population again and see how many turtles that you find this time you had seen at a previous visit. Um, and so basically we used a model that, that would assume that all of our turtles had an equal probability of being caught in every given year and that their survivability might change over time because this was a multi-year study. So what we, the number that I came upon um, in terms of reproductively active females is that there are probably about 108, 110 Re reproductively active females at this site. Now you're going to notice that I'm very careful to say reproductively active females. I wasn't able to uh, estimate the population of males because we never saw them. They weren't coming out of the water. Only the females were coming out to nest. 
I don't know anything about juveniles because we were not encountering them either. But if we think about this, and thinking about the fact that there were 95 turtles that we managed to identify as individuals, it seems like we, we made a pretty good, um, we had a, a good success in encountering pretty, most of the turtles that were at this site. So I feel like we did a, a good job of measuring the, 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 uh, the, pop, the size of the population there. So let's talk about nest locations, because this was really the meat and bones of my, um, my thesis. Um, we, we mapped 226 nests um, in three different categories. First of all are the viable nests. Those are the ones that are in blue here on the map. And those are nests where the female laid eggs and completed, completing the nesting event with, with viable eggs in the nest. There were 55 nest attempts. Those are the ones in yellow. That's when the turtle came out of the water started to nest and then for whatever reason didn't finish the nesting attempt so she did not lay her eggs there were various reasons that this would happen sometimes maybe she hit a rock while she was digging um, so let me tell you just a little bit about how turtles lay their eggs because it's kind of funny um, so they this species lays their eggs really only when the, dry, the ground is very dry and so they need to be able to figure out a way to dig so what they do is they come out of the water when they've decided where they're going to nest they pee on the ground and then once they've urinated on the ground that softens up the dirt and it allows them to dig and i think what it does is it gives them the ability to dig a very precise hole that's exactly the size for the clutch that they're going to lay um and and, and it just gives them a lot of control so after they've dug their hole they'll lay their eggs and then they'll cover it back up and they're really good at hiding the nest. So they'll, they'll, kick, they'll, they'll cover it up with dirt, then they'll like push grass over it and things like that. They're really difficult to see. There were times that I sat and I watched a female through the entire process of laying her nest. She covered it up and walked away and I went over to the spot and five minutes later, I couldn't really see where the nest was. Um, so they're very good at hiding the nest visually. Um, and this process would take anywhere from maybe 45 minutes um, to a couple of hours, depending on, you know, various factors. So sometimes the females would, would not finish the nesting attempt. Then we also have the, the orange dots on the map are nests that were predated or nests that we, um, that, that some predator, fox or a skunk, um, I think usually foxes or skunks were probably the ones that were doing most of this. Um, raccoons, opossums had located the nest and then dug up the nest and eaten the eggs. So those are the three categories of nests. But for my purposes, looking at where do the, the, the females choose to nest, all of these nest locations were equally valuable to me because each one represents a time that a female turtle came out of the water and made the decision to, to lay an egg, lay, lay her eggs in this particular spot. Whether or not she was successful didn't really matter. It's that she had made that choice. So what are some of the features of preferred nesting habitat for these species? Um, so we found turtle nests anywhere from one meter from the lake all the way to uh, 332 meters away from the lake. So on, on average, they were nesting about 64 meters away from the lake. Now here, I like this view. This is a really nice aerial view. And so it gives you a good idea of the size and this, or sort of the scale of this lake. And so this is the part where there's water most or all of the time. This part is also wet a lot. This is the part that can dry out first. But, but you know, if we think what's interesting to me is looking at this entire area, that this is the only area where we ever found nests. We didn't find nests around the rest of the circumference of the lake. So that then there's some interesting questions to, you know, that, that are raised. Why are they choosing to nest here? Mostly, I think it's a matter of access. I also think it's a matter of, of temperature that this, this area has the sunlight hitting it at the right angle to provide them with the sort of um, thermal conditions or the temperature conditions that those eggs would need to incubate. Um, again, they nested exclusively on this north and northwest sides. Am I frozen? There we go. I might have been frozen there for a second. Um, they nested exclusively on the north and northwest sides of the lake. 
Now, we also found that they had a distinct preference for nesting close to tree canopy cover. So if we look at, uh, this is just a selection of nests. When I'm frozen, can you still hear me? I don't know. I just see that my little icon is frozen and I'm not sure what's going on. So let me know if you're not able to hear me. If Nicolette, if you could just uh, say something, if, if you want me to repeat anything, because I was frozen. Um, so just, just a selection of the nests. M most of them, 90% of their nests, at least 90%, are laid within 10 meters of the nearest tree canopy cover. Now, they tended to not nest directly under trees, but they also didn't, they, they would rarely nest like way out in the open. So, you know, my hypothesis about that is that there's some, there's that having um, some shade, at least for parts of the day, was going to control the temperature environment in the nests and that that was something that was uh, beneficial to the offspring. Um, another way of looking at this, this same data, this is just the distribution of distances of the nests, um, some of the nests that we located. And again, we can see that the vast majority of them are within 10 meters of canopy cover and a, a pretty good percentage of them are even closer within sort of five or six meters. So they really like nesting along those, the edge between the forested habitat and the grassland or meadow habitat. Okay, so let's talk now about nest site fidelity. And um, I'm not keeping total track of time. So Nicolette, if you could give me like a five minute warning, that would be great. Um, so we tracked 51 different individual turtles to their nest sites on multiple occasions. So that meant that for this individual turtle, we, we, we had a nest from her in one year and then at least one other year where she nested a, another time. And in some cases we had many, 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 many nesting events for these turtles. So what I did in order to evaluate whether or not they were having some site fidelity, you know, whether or not they're returning to the same location is that I compared the distances between consecutive nests of a single female and just, well, how far apart on average are the nests for females who, female turtles laying their eggs at this site? So I came up with this kind of estimate of just the random distance between any two nests. And then I looked at, is that more or less than the distance from individual females than where they were choosing to nest? So let me give you an example of how this plays out with just one turtle. This is turtle number 201. I think she might have been our, our turtle that, that was our double clutcher too, that once that she laid two uh, nests in a season. But we observed five different nesting events from her. So the first one in 2009, there's the location of it. Uh, the, and that was an attempt, so she didn't successfully nest. She came back five days later, and this is where she made another attempt. Um, and you can see, so what are those? About 25, 30 meters apart, 35 meters apart. And then she came back again a few days later, and she finally was able to lay her, her nest with eggs in it. And then that was a 48 meter difference from her, her second attempt. But look how close it was to her first attempt, right? So pretty close when we think about what the scope of the entire um, site is. The following year, she came out and made an attempt in the same area that was 25 meters from her first one. Um, again, in 2010, then she, she made a viable nest 21 meters away. And when we look at all of the different nests that, she, that we uh, witnessed her laying, the average distance between nests was about 32 meters. So that's pretty close when we think about how large this site is in general and that we have turtles nesting across a pretty large, large distance. So to give you some other examples of how this looks, if this is our entire speed, so what we were looking at just there, her nests were all located within this little area right here. So every single time she made a nest attempt, it was within that one location. So here are some additional, so this is that turtle, this is 201's nest, so you can see how they clustered. Now, and here each of the different colors is another individual female. So we can see this one, both of the times she nested, they were, it was here in this location. Here was a turtle that both of her times they were here, right? So you can see that right now, Anecdotally, right, I haven't run any stats on this yet, 
but just looking at these patterns, it certainly looks like at least some of our females are definitely have a preference for nesting in a similar location time after time. Um, now, not all females, right? Here's a female who nested kind of far apart. Here's a female who nested kind of far apart. Oh, here's one who nested really close together, close together, close together, right? Oh, what about this? Is there really only one nest there? No, actually, those were two nests that were so close together. Those were within, you know, sort of five meters of each other. So not every turtle in the population was nesting really close to previous nests, but certainly many of them did seem to exhibit a pattern. Now, when I looked at this from a statistical standpoint, what I wanted to do, as I mentioned, I wanted to look at the, the distance, the average distance between nests just in general, and then the, the, the average distance of nests with one female, right? How close is this one female nesting to her previous nest? And I found that for females that we found in multiple years, the, they were nesting about, on average, about 40 meters, of, within 40 meters of their previous nesting attempt. And when I looked at females who only nested once, so thinking about just randomly, where, where, do, where are turtles randomly placing their nests? The distance between those nests was about 146 meters. So that to me was a pretty, pretty strong evidence that there is some level of fidelity happening within this population of turtles. Okay, now what do we think drives this behavior? Um, since I was not able, I mean, I wasn't doing an experiment, so all I could look at were other factors that might correlate with this behavior. But some of the things that appeared to have a relationship with, with the, the distance between these multiple nests of an individual female, um, that carapace length and maximum temperature seem to have a relationship together. That larger turtles tended to nest farther apart from their previous nests as the temperatures increase. Now, again, this wasn't an experimental setup, so it's difficult for me to, to say with certainty why this is happening. But my hypothesis was that larger turtles, that as the temperatures got, uh, got warmer, maybe uncomfortably warm, I mean, this is a field site where it was, not it was not uncommon for temperatures to be above 100 degrees, sometimes as much as 105 or 110 during the day. Um, the turtles, larger turtles, needed to get out of the water, get their eggs in the ground, and back into the water sooner when the temperatures were hot. And so they may have been slightly less choosy about where they were placing their nests when there was a, a risk of um, them suffering some sort of stress from, from severe heat. Again, that's just a hypothesis. Now, what are some of the conservation implications then for my work? Um, as we're, I'm sure we're all aware, Habitats for wildlife are disappearing just globally at an alarming rate. Um, we're losing wetlands, we're lo vernal pools are in particular a habitat type that here in Northern California, Northern and Central California, something like 90% of, of vernal habitats um, have been lost um, over the past you know, several decades. Um, and you know, we're all aware of the impact that this can have on wildlife. We're also experiencing some shifts in climate and weather changes globally, right? And I think we've already, we're starting to see the effects of those things on even on human populations and let alone the, let alone the way that they're going to, to affect wildlife. So when we're talking about a species that seems to exhibit some non-random behavior, um, the concern is that this could increase their risk of extinction or of, of you know, declining um, because of both habitat loss and changes in climate. So think about it this way, is if, if I'm used to nesting in one place and I'm always going to go back to that same place to nest time after time, but the conditions change and maybe now it's too hot for my eggs to develop, or maybe it's the, the, the climate isn't right for my eggs to develop, or maybe somebody came and built a golf course where I'm wanting to lay my eggs. The, the, the individual turtles, they might not realize that this habitat has become um, inappropriate, and they may still lay their eggs there anyway, or they may just choose not to nest at all in the case of if the habitat being developed, right? And if there's a casino there or a golf course or whatever and that that could really impact their ability to reproduce. 
Um, and particularly if the turtles don't realize that the habitat has been degraded, we would call that an ecological trap, a place where animals are used to, uh, uh, used to coming, so they continue to come there, not realizing that their fitness is going to be decreased as a result because the conditions no longer support the, the behavior in the same way that they did in the past. So that's something that we worry about with nest site fidelity. Can these turtles adjust and, and choose nesting? If, if their previous nesting locations become unavailable or degraded, are they going to be able to switch gears and find other places to nest where they will still be able to have reproductive success? So another, another real important consideration when we're talking about turtles is as a semi-aquatic species, they have a need for their aquatic habitat to be maintained. And they also need, like I mentioned, these are species that have to nest on land. So they have to have appropriate terrestrial or upland habitat available to them. I think especially with turtles, or uh, turtles are, are one of these, frogs maybe in this category as well. We think about them as aquatic, so we think, well, as long as we protect the river or the creek or the lake, they'll be fine. But that's not necessarily true if they don't have the land habitat that they need in addition to just the waterways. Um, and when we look at things like governmental guidelines for how much of a buffer zone you need to have along, for example, the, the, the banks of a river before you start building things on it, are, these are often not adequate for the needs of wildlife who, who need those, those habitats to either to, to nest or to have uh, refugia to come out. Like there are times, maybe times of the year they're going to estivate or, or live at a dry season outside of the water, things like that. Let me show you an example of what this would, sort of what a 20, if we think of a 25 meter buffer zone, which is probably pretty standard in some areas, and, and what would be the impact on the turtles if we're talking about a 25 meter buffer zone beyond which you could develop the land, this is the number of nests at my site that would have been able to be, be laid, right? Beyond that, this is 50 meters. So this is how many nests we would have if we left a 50 meter buffer zone. This is how many nests we would have with a 100 meter buffer zone. So you can see, you know, even if 25, 25, even 50 meters, we're really compromising the ability of these, these turtles to have the habitat that they need. And then if we wanted all of the nests, we'd have to go out even further, right? This one again is about 330 meters from the edge of the water. So um, in conclusion, um, one of the things that I thought was really, um, really meaningful about my study was that it's it's enhanced our knowledge of this species. So like I said, there have been some research done on western pond turtles, not huge amounts. Um, it lives in a relatively, you know, it's, it's got a sort of a relatively limited range, but it is our only freshwater aquatic turtle. And from that standpoint alone, I think it, it's pretty easy to make an argument that they're worth our consideration and worth making sure that they are able to, to survive and persist into the future. Um, so my study has really shed a lot of light on to the life history of these turtles. And the more that we can identify behavioral patterns, particularly anything like nest site fidelity that's a non-random pattern, it can allow us to predict their behavior more reliably. And can, it can also help us to determine what habitat they need in order to survive, right? If we have to make decisions about which kind of, which, which areas of habitat to conserve, the more that we understand, well, turtles need this and this, that can help us conserve the habitat that they need. So my study can potentially help to inform land, manage land management decisions about conserving upland areas, particularly those that are adjacent to waterways where this species lives. Um, and they when, are, a conser they, they are a con interested in conservation. Sorry, did you say something? Yes, uh, you have five minutes. Awesome, thank you, I'm almost done. Um, so uh, here in California, we consider the Western pond turtle a species of special concern. So they're not yet considered vulnerable or endangered, but we have noticed population declines and we want to be keeping an eye on them. In Oregon, they are considered vulnerable. And then a little bit farther north in Washington, they are considered endangered. So I think it's really, this is a great time for us to look at these turtles here in California and try and make sure we, we 
can provide them with the habitat and the conditions they need before the populations really start to crash and, and this, this species gets into trouble from a conservation standpoint. Uh, so I wanted, there's lo lots and lots of people that I could acknowledge. The Nature Conservancy, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Lake County Land Trust who manages that land now, my advisor, Nick Geist, my lab partner, Nicole Christie, um, former lab, uh, my, the woman who was started this, one of the people who started this project, Zanny Delara, Matthew Bettelheim, who originally discovered this location where we did our um, research, Oakland Zoo and San Francisco Zoo, and lots and lots and lots of Sonoma State undergrads um, and grad students who worked on this project and without whom we could not have done this project. Um, here are my photo credits. I'm going to leave this up for now. Um, if people are interested in photo credits, I'm more than happy to make those available. Most of the photos are one that I, ones that I took myself. Um, all right, and that's that's what I have. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Wendy, so much. Yeah, if you want to type in your questions or um, I think there's enough of us here, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, go for it. I have a question. Yeah. Um, would you say that habitat loss is the factor that is putting these the species most at risk right now? Um, yes, I would go for this species for sure. I mean, that's, that's true of most species in general. I mean, habitat loss is the single biggest factor that's impacting species right now. Um, another thing that Western pond turtles dealt with was that they have been used, they've been um, captured for food a lot. Um, particularly like around in the Bay Area, that was a big concern where they were being, a lot of them were being harvested for food. Um, and if they were being harvested unsustainably, that could be a source of decline. Um, but I think that right now it's, it's habitat loss that we're really the most concerned about. And then thinking about habitat loss and other aspect of that, um, climate change is going to produce habitat the loss of appropriate habitat, even in places where maybe the habitat itself isn't being developed by people, but that as we see climate shifts, it's going to change where these species are going to be able to continue to, to live and thrive. Yeah, Ron. Can I go ahead? Yeah. So we have nine Western pond turtles in our pond and have had them for a number of years and never seen um, a nest or eggs or uh, juveniles. Okay. And what do you suppose is going on? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, they're pretty sneaky. So it's possible that they could be nesting and you've just never seen it. Um, if you, like, like I said, if we didn't watch the female actually laying her nest, you cannot go out and just like look for nests and find them. You're, they're, they're really well hidden. Um, the only way to really find nests after the fact is if a predator has found them and dug them up, then we would find signs, we would find eggshells and that would be easy to find. Um, so it's possible that they're nesting. Again, the juveniles, the juveniles are about that big when they're born um, and they're gonna hatch from their eggs, they're gonna go into the water and they're not really gonna come out of the water again. So it's possible that you could have some nesting going on and just that you're just not seeing it. But it's also possible that there isn't really appropriate habitat for them or maybe, um, I don't know, maybe all of your females are, maybe all your turtles are females or all of them are males or there's, there's some re other reason that recruitment isn't happening. Um, one thing that I would suggest is that they definitely are going to need to have some areas where there's sh some shade, like trees or even shrubs. They can nest under like a big, nice big manzanita um, or something like that. Um, and th that it's not, that the habitat isn't being irrigated or like sprinkler system, something like that would definitely, um, they would not be able to nest in an area that's being, where the ground is being watered on a regular basis because that would destroy their eggs. Um, their eggs are kind of, um, it's definitely different from like a chicken egg. They're leathery and they, they, in this species, this is not true for every species of turtle, but their eggs are so porous that they will, they will like, like absorb water that fall, comes into the nest and it can actually cause the eggs to burst. Mm -hmm. So if you have anything like that going on on your, your property, that could be a reason why they're not nesting. So again, but they might be and you're just not seeing it. Um, somebody shared with me a photo that they found actually, and this was right, this was in Ronert Park and it was like somewhere Stony Point Road and like 
near where the, the movie theater is. Um, and it was a little turtle that was just booking along over somewhere. And it was definitely a Western pond turtle juvenile. So they, you know, they are nesting in our area. Yeah, and we had somebody bring us a juvenile just last week, which we added to our pond. Of course, we haven't seen it since, but rather hard to see. And you won't. Yeah, exactly. You won't. Just like, you know, how many years was I looking at turtles? I don't think I've ever seen a male turtle out of the water. I don't think, and I've never seen them in the water either, because when I, you know, like we would go in the water to release head started babies. That's a whole other project to talk about. But, um, you know, as soon as we put them in the water, they swim away and then they're gone. They they want nothing to do with us. We so, would be open to anybody. We would be open to anybody who wanted to come and look at or deal with or investigate our our pond turtle life. Oh, cool! I'll keep that in mind um, because it would be interesting to see. You know, like what is the it's like what what's what's the like the sex ratio of turtles at your site, um, and bringing a juvenile. Depending how big was it? Oh, the, the size of a of a um, silver dollar. Oh, okay. So maybe a year old, maybe not even a year. Um, you know, four or five years from now, we think that's about how long it takes them to get to being reproductively mature. Um, who knows? Maybe you'll start having some more um, recruitment. I think that's a, that's a it's it's really exciting to have them on on your property. Um, right. And there's no reason that if you if they have proper habitat that they wouldn't be able to. So please feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to share with you some other ideas about, about the kind of habitat that they need. Are bullfrogs a predator? I, am I frozen? Yes, they are. They can be. Um, that's one of the things that, that was not ideal about some alterations that were done to the lake. Um, you, may, you may know that you know, bullfrogs have a, a multi-year life cycle. So in, a, in, a, in an actual vernal lake where the water dries up every year, a bullfrog can't survive because they can't complete their life cycle but they can here and they are big enough. Am I frozen again? I just see my image and I'm like, anyways, um, they can eat um, juvenile turtles, like small ones. Um, and they do make probably not a huge, a number of the times, but we've definitely found bullfrogs with baby Western pond turtles in their stomachs. So they are potentially um, a predator of juveniles. Thank you. Huh. Mm -hmm. Thank you for great questions. Um, I'm going to read some more questions from the chat since we're getting a lot, which is cool. Um, Kate uh, says, uh, thank you. Great presentation. Are you also looking at site characteristics that correlate with successful nesting and whether the, uh, the females return to those sites or do the females even know if they were successful? Okay, that's a whole bunch of really good questions. So let me try to, to break this down. Um, so first of all, to talk about the females, the females don't know if they're being successful or not. They come and they lay their eggs and they go back to the water and that's it, right? They're not, they're, they don't give any parental care beyond selecting an appropriate nest site. So when we talk about nest site fidelity and this is being a behavior that's like that they're returning to the same site, it's definitely an instinctual behavior more than something that they learn based on their experiences in the past. Now they may have experiences like maybe they'll remember in this location I hit rocks and I wasn't able to nest, but they have no idea whether or not the nest that they laid, if those offspring were successful. So from that standpoint, we're thinking more about this on an evolutionary scale. And if there was a female who nested in a location and she was successful, those offspring carry her genetic material forward and so whatever it was that encouraged her to nest there, those, those babies might inherit that trait as well, right? Um, then the other part of your question, thinking about um, other factors, we definitely looked at a lot of other factors. We were tracking temperature. Um, to some degree, we started trying, like we looked at, at habitat type in terms of, you know, like I mentioned, the, the living or wanting to nest near the forest edge and not in the meadow. Um, we, a little bit, we looked at things like soil moisture, but really there, there wasn't any in any of the areas. They nest in really dry areas. Um, but things like temperature, elevation, all of those sorts of things we, we definitely did look at. Um, this one site, the habitat is fairly consistent. So it was a little bit, you know, I, I felt like that what we were seeing in terms of nesting was a lot about the, the orientation, like north to south, east, west orientation 
that there was something about the, the, the angle of the light hitting, which was where they were choosing to nest, which is why they weren't nesting on the other side of the lake. But we've definitely also seen them nesting in other habitats. They nest near the coast. Um, there's a population right now in Point Reyes that we're studying. Um, so they can definitely live um, in a lot of different habitats. So I suspect that this popular or that this turtle in general, they have a pretty wide range of tolerances um, in, in places they can live, like temperature regimes. They can live in urban areas if they have appropriate habitat. Um, that sort of thing. So they, they have the capacity to live in a lot of different areas. Um, and definitely those kind of, it, under, the more we understand those factors, the better. Does that answer your question? That sounds great. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, if um, yeah, it was, oh, yeah, great. Uh, okay, so we have another question uh, from Brewer. Uh, for the double clutching, is that from being inseminated at two separate times? I know this is possible with some mammal species. That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know enough about their reproductive behavior as to whether or not they would have had, you know, where they would have retained some sperm or whether they, I mean, my, my guess is that it was a separate fertilization event, but I don't know for sure. I, I'm not sure anybody's looked at that in this population of turtles, and honestly, I'm not sure how that would work with turtles in general. I'd never really thought about it. It's a great question. I just don't know the answer. That's interesting to think about, yeah. Um, okay, we have another, another question. Okay, so Nick let's ask, are there other species like frogs, salamanders, et cetera, that can be used to strengthen the argument to have a bigger protection zone near Verna pools and lakes? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, yes, there are. I, I'm not prepared right now to like give you specific examples, but, but one of the things that I think is, is um, an interesting way to think about conservation is a lot of times we tend to, humans, we tend to sort of put our conservation efforts um, around sort of focal species. Like there's the, the species that's really cute and fluffy or it's kind of really cute like a baby turtle and that's how we choose where to put our money. Um, and that can be an okay strategy sometimes, but I think that the more that we can consider the needs of additional species, the better. Because so, here, to give you an example, um, for a while, there were some things that they were doing with um, in creek restorations or, or stream restorations with, for salmonids, and I don't think they're doing these practices anymore, but where removing certain kinds of woody debris from the, the areas, they thought that was good for the fish. Actually, it's not, but what it was doing was removing turtle habitat. So if in this, in this case, they were doing conservation for one species that was potentially harming the ability of another species to persist. So the more that we understand the natural history of the, the, the widest variety of species, that's going to make it much more, that's going to give us much more ability to successfully do conservation for everything. Of course, what does that involve? It involves time to study things. It involves money. Doing research is, is costly and time consuming. I mean, not like hugely costly. My study was, was cheap comparatively, except for my time, right? There wasn't a lot of, I didn't have to go buy a lot of expensive equipment and that sort of thing. Um, but the more that we can understand that, the better. And yet funding for conservation and for this kind of research is always really limited. Um, so if there's a focal species that we can say, hey, this is good for turtles. And, and then chances are, if we're conserving that habitat for turtles, other species will also benefit. But definitely, the more that we can bring in other species and, and understand their needs as well, that's going to help us to put together a better, a more comprehensive conservation strategy, building maybe a network of, of, of nearby related habitats with some connectivity that's going to allow a lot more species to be, to be able to thrive. Very interesting. Yeah. OK, we have one another question uh, from Patty. Uh, she says, thank you for your presentation. How long does it take for a female to produce enough urine to retry nesting if first attempt didn't work? That's a great question. So um, if she has unsuccessfully nested, that day she's done. She'll go back to the water. Um, sometimes it, it, would, it could take as little as sort of 24 hours. Sometimes we would see these turtles come back the next day. Sometimes we wouldn't see them. I would say that usually it wasn't the next day. Usually it was two to three days later. Um, but sometimes they definitely were back the next day. But 
it's a good point because if and that was you know that was just another another factor in terms of our interactions with them because I've been peed on by a lot of turtles because what you, what they do when you're messing with them if you pick them up they're like no and they pee on you right so I've been peed on a lot and we knew that's why we knew as soon as we picked up a turtle as, and she peed she couldn't nest that night so then she would need to be put back in the pond but it would be anywhere from like one to maybe three four five days before she would be able to come back and make another attempt it's a good question that's a really insightful like yeah that's a thing they don't just have endless amounts of urine and that's why like if you're in the desert and you see gopher tortoises or something like that you really don't want to mess with them i mean unless you really think this thing is get, about to get run over by a truck in the middle of the road um, in which case, don't get run over in the truck along with it. But picking them up could actually kill them if they urinate and then they don't have access to water. So it, it's, a, it's a good question um, with respect to turtles. Yeah, I'm well, I didn't think about it's that. It's a good question. Oh, yeah. Very good. Um, I think I'm going to wrap up right now. Um, Wendy, do you have a few minutes at the end to answer any remaining questions? Sure. Okay, great. Sure. Okay, great. Yeah, I can hang out for, for a little while. Okay, sounds good. Okay, well, um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. You're and welcome. Thanks, and thanks everyone for attending. I hope you all learned a lot. I definitely did. I hope you all feel empowered to use like these, this information a little bit more and, ha and have some fun. Again, please feel free to me email me after we sign off here and I'll try to reply. Um, or maybe Carrie, Carrie also has um, a lot of information too, and Wendy as well. Um, this is just one of many deep dive style events and one of over two dozen virtual events the center has planned through June and more events and learning opportunities are being added all the time. So check out cei.sonoma.edu and you can pre-register for those events. Feel free to spread the word um, even to those who don't live in the, in the North Bay. That's, uh, virtual events can be a great way to connect with people all, all over the world. Yeah, I'll be back talking about benthic, benthic macroinvertebrates sometime next week. It'd be better yeah. if I could say the words. We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you have a few weeks. <laughs> um, uh, some specific, some other, uh, yeah, some other events that may be of interest to you um, include um, this Thursday, May 7th at 3 p.m. There's a Learn with the Naturalist event where you will learn to create shelter for wildlife during the shelter in place. That's sort of fun. Um, on Friday, uh, May 8th at 2 p.m., there's a citizen science event uh, where we're, we're going to explore California's plants using the, the phone app, CalFlora. Um, and um, on Monday, uh, May 11th, we have another event featuring birds, this time coming at them from a more research-oriented place, investigating the physics of waves and bird songs and sampling ourselves and of course on I believe yeah on May 15th we will be back with Wendy. Um, so stay safe and we hope to see you soon. If you need to leave now go ahead but uh, we will be answering a few more questions uh, so stay tuned for that. So thank you everyone. And I am Ron I am in the process of typing you a message um, I don't necessarily have any papers that come to mind, but look up work by Bruce Burry, B-U-R-Y, and then Philip Spinks, who was um, at Davis until fairly recently, and both of them have done work with these turtles, so they have some published work that you might be interested in. Oh, and, oh, there's another thing. What's, uh... Um, feel free to email me and I will try to remember there's another paper that's actually quite old it's from decades ago but it was a really nice like layout of the natural history of this turtle as it was known um, at the time I don't remember that the the author but I could find it so if you're interested in that feel free to shoot me an email and I'll try to find it for you cool great uh, let's see I don't okay I think you, you answered that question yeah by, by Ron um, and Nick says, you know, love the population estimate slide pictures. Very cool. Um, I do have a question as yeah. well. Um, so going back to the, um, the um, sort of, uh, how do I say it? the um, guidelines that have been set in place, uh, or some of the guidelines, um, uh, who in the government decides guidelines to protect, you know, certain 
um, areas around like lakes and vernal pools. That's and a good question. That um, I think that there are different levels of that. There can be some sort of larger scale guidelines, but then on a local basis, communities can sometimes decide for themselves. Um, I would think that, and I, this is, I'm just, right now, I'm just kind of guessing on some of this stuff because I don't know for a fact, but I would guess that looking at like local water agencies would maybe be one thing, um, one place to look at that they might have for certainly making recommendations, if not being the ones who who are actually making the, the um, you know, the, the final determinations about, about what kind of buffer zones there are. Um, so I think it would be, it's probably a variety of different agencies that would be doing that. Okay, interesting. Um, and okay, I, if anyone has any more questions, go ahead. I have another one. Yeah, so I can, Ron? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so our pond is about 300 feet by 150 feet in size. <clears throat> We're at about 1200 feet um approximately 800 feet above the town of boonville in the hills okay so in mendocino county um and these pond turtles showed up entirely on their own they were not something that we brought in at the time we had a real severe problem with bullfrogs um, which we got rid of uh, through heroic efforts um, and once they were gone our um Tree frogs and and then the and then the pond turtles return. Yay! Um, so we feel like it's been a a successful effort, um, but now we're we're fighting off the bullfrogs still. They keep appearing, but it's just yeah. amazing how far they can travel. The turtles. I mean, we're we're talking a fairly steep climb up a uh, a, a watercourse that is only wet during the winter. And is that pretty well appreciated or understood that they can travel in such for sure. Yeah, they definitely. So one, one study that you might look up uh, there, it was a, another um, master's thesis that was done at Sonoma State. Um, and his name is, please come into my brain name. Oh, it was in Dr. Geist's lab. And it's like, if you were to look at like, look up like pond turtles in the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Oh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, which is really stupid. We were in the lab together. Um, <laughs> But he did a, a study where he actually put telemetry on a whole bunch of turtles and he looked at their movements throughout the Laguna. Um, and that, yeah, they sometimes will travel great distances. Um, we would find sometimes we would find turtles halfway down the mountain from our field site. And it was just like a turtle just decided to book out and take off. Um, elevation, not a problem. They're super climby. Um, they're, they're really good at climbing. They could climb almost straight up in certain situations and do. Um, but yeah, they, these are definitely turtles that will, will move around the habitat a lot. I don't think it's unusual at all to think of them, you know, moving those kind of distances. I have a follow-up question actually. Um, so why, why do they move? If it's, if it's not just to lay eggs in particular locations, like for example, one time um, at Osborne Preserve, I was out there by myself doing research and you know where Turtle Pond is, right? And then if you go up the Madrone Trail and you go almost all the way to the top, you're almost at Kelly Pond, there's like these back and forths. There was a turtle in the middle of that trail. Like it probably would take me 45 minutes to hike at a, at a good pace between Turtle Pond and right there. And there was just a turtle walking up the mountain. Like, can you say why that, why would they do that? Um, specifically, there could be a lot of reasons. Um, they could be looking for better habitat. Maybe there's a lot of competition for resources. Um, maybe they just have some instinctual drive. Maybe it's a temperature related, like the, related to the ambient temperature, that they're trying to go to either a cooler or a warmer location. Um, I don't know enough about, about the dispersal habits of this species in general. I mean, certainly at our site, like I said, most of these turtles, we found them nesting year and year after year after year. Now, does that mean that the females stayed place, slate stayed put all the time? For all I know, some of them were moving around the the area. Um, you know, some of them may have been moving around the area um, between nesting seasons. Um, a lot of times, I would think if somebody's actually making a big trek. And like, you know, like Ron, like your turtles at your pond, hopefully they've made a trek and now they're going to stay there. But I can't really answer that question. I think that there are a lot of different factors that might encourage them to leave. Um, 
Yeah. But now, one, other one, thing that, one other thing that sometimes where you will see them out of the water is that this is a species that often does something called estivation which is where they will need, to, it's like hibernation, but instead of being protected from a cold, like a winter, like a, a harsh winter, they're protecting themselves from a dry season. So sometimes they'll leave their waterways and they'll go like bury themselves under a clump of leaves in the forest or something. Um, and so sometimes they may be moving around the habitat to prepare for something like that. Very interesting. Um, I don't see, oh, we have another, oh, okay. Okay, Ron has um, put um, contact information on the site. Excellent, thank you. Oh. Um, I have one more question, unless anyone else has any more questions. Um, okay, uh, my question is: um, Are you how or are you able to um, figure out how like your presence? with the turtles affects turtle nesting behaviors or if it does at all? That's a good question. And um, I'm sure that it does affect their behavior. Um, that was one of the reasons that we um, would sometimes did the radio telemetry because obviously, I mean, think about being a turtle and hi, this gigantic creature comes up to you, picks you up off the ground, maybe takes you back to their car and takes you to camp overnight with them like that's what we were doing with these turtles that's a big impact on them um and so the idea then behind the telemetry was that we have this one like very intense interaction with them put them back but then when they come out to nest we can then be tracking them at a greater distance and hopefully not affecting their behavior quite as much certainly when we were when we're tracking them like if we're just watching them move through the habitat and we're sort of following them they're aware that we're there and it, it will sometimes change their behavior. Sometimes they would abort a nest attempt if we were too close. Um, but then sometimes it's hard to tell if they, why they aborted a nesting attempt. So it's, it's a difficult to get our, our hands on, like to actually quantify that. But absolutely, our, our presence there is, would, it would have some effect on their behavior. So we tried to minimize it in the ways that we knew how. Um, but it definitely, we were still definitely having an effect. Okay, well, I do yeah. have one more thought that I was wondering, um, and then I'll then I'll be done. I was just wondering about uh, it, different connections, ecological connections with this species and others in the environment, right? Thinking of other reasons why we might justify needing to protect this habitat other than the fact that it's a species of special concern, but you know, looking at all the trickle down effects and 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 anything else you know about um, those interconnections. Uh, there were so many. I mean, there are so many. So, you know, what are the kind of species, what kind of the kind of habitats that turtles need? They need water and they need associated upland habitats. And we know that, um, you know, maintaining ecological biodiversity is really important to us for a lot of reasons. Um, having different speed, like having the most biodiverse, biodiversity possible in, in any given ecosystem, um, it, it means that it's more likely that ecosystem will persist and continue to perform whatever services we're getting from it, right? A healthy waterways here in Sonoma County, some of the places where these turtles live are directly responsible for some of the water that comes to, through our faucets right through the Russia River water basin. So the more that we can maintain those, those aquatic habitats in, in good health, that has a direct impact on our health. Um, the more that we have like redundancy in our ecosystems, multiple species that are maybe fulfilling similar functions, um, that can be really useful to making sure that ecosystems uh, function is maintained. Um, right now, a really big and interesting um, push for research is looking at ecological regulation of things like diseases. Right. And there's really good evidence that having more biodiversity, having more different species as an, in an area makes it less likely that there will be one or two hosts that a, a disease that a pathogen can infest really effectively and spread that disease wider. If you have more species, you're less likely to have diseases be spread as, as, as easily to human populations. So there are a million, like literally endless, I could talk for like hours on all of the different ways that, that preserving habitat for species like a turtle is going to benefit 
humans in a lot of ways. Um, and so, but I think I, if I wanted to boil it down, I would just say that the more that we have areas where we are not disrupting the, the like existing regimes, uh, hydrologic regimes, fire regimes, that's a huge one for us here in Northern California. And we've seen how we've gotten bit in the booty with the way that we have been managing fires, right? Um, so those kinds of things that when we're doing things that are gonna benefit wildlife, those same sort of, of things will lead to healthy ecosystems that will benefit us as well in the long run mm -hmm. and the short well run. Well said. That's and great. all the runs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's great. And um, do they, um, Western pond turtles, do they eat like azola or, um, you know, water fern or I, duck I doubt it. Anything? I I think they're mostly pretty predatory. I think they're mostly okay. eating animal material. I think most of the plant material that they eat is incidental. Like there's a shrimp sitting on a plant and they eat the whole thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I don't think that they would be considered um, herbivores or significant, um, you know, making a significant dent in any of those. Now is Azola, Azola is native though, right? Mm -hmm. Is it just a, is it a problem because it's it's spreading or is it just a thing? If if the if the the water system is out of balance, then it can just cover a pond, and that then you don't have the um, light and heat go through the way you would normally need to for other species. But um, so I was just wondering if maybe turtles are helping control that. Um, Not these turtles, no. Mm -hmm. So what do they mostly eat? Um, a lot of crayfish. Um, a lot of insects, um, other invertebrates. Um, I mean, they're really very opportunistic, so they'll probably eat just about everything that they can get their little mouths on. Um, but there was another study that was done in my lab a few years ago by a woman named Nicole Karras. She actually looked at their diets where she went and she was uh, c capturing turtles and then um, looking at their stomach contents. And mm. it, crayfish was a hugely significant part of their diet. So things like snails, uh, you know, larvae, um, probably small fish, any of that kind of thing. They're, they're, they're very predatory. And the polygons. So sorry, I was going to say, so a lot of the things that you might talk about a couple Fridays from now in this your macro talk. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Mm -hmm. I'm excited for that talk. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Thank you for coming. And thanks for asking such great questions. I'm really glad to hear that you have some cool turtles on your property. We're thrilled. Yeah, they're, they're great. They're a great species. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, thank you.